We've been um, <laughs> getting a whole lot of people writing in and asking questions about the clothes that we wear. So in an effort to try to recreate life in the 1700s and 1800s and be as authentic as possible, we try to use the right materials, um, the right colors, um, and the right style. So instead of doing my typical wee bit of history, which perhaps might bore people to death, I'm actually going to, or I should say we, Kathy's en route out, are, are going to actually build uh, what was probably one of the more common garments of the time period, which is a had a number of names. One was called a trade shirt because it was found at trading posts. Uh, you could get them ready-made, so somebody would build that for you, hand-sewn, of course, but quite dear to buy, so more often than not uh, made by people on the homesteads. Um, another name for them, and probably more common, was just a hunting shirt. They called it a shirt because it was closed fronted. So the frock that I'm wearing is open fronted and Kathy is pretty cold out. So she's wearing a, a capote, which is also open fronted uh, with an added hood for really cold weather. So you can't get a whole lot simpler uh, than this particular pattern. Uh, so what we have here essentially is uh, a bunch of rectangles. So over here, we've got uh, four squares. Uh, that are called gussets. We've got a rectangle here that gets folded in half for the collar. The most complicated piece is uh, the part that's going to get sewn, uh, the V part that will form the top of the trading shirt at the collar. Uh, two, two rectangles that will form the sleeves and they're cut on a slight taper because we want it a little bit smaller at the front or at the bottom I should say at the cuff than at the armpit. And finally two larger rectangles that will form the front and the back. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm going to get myself a cup of coffee. I'm going to get settled in here and uh, I'm going to try to sew this together with my clumsy fingers, but uh, I'll rely on Kathy's dexterity for most of it. That was a good time to tell a story, don't you think? <laughs> what do you think? A wee bit of history? Why not? <laughs> uh, well, you don't have to ask me twice to tell a little history. Uh, what should we talk about? Uh, wool, wool, bl wool blankets, wee bit of history. Okay, I can do that actually. So, reason I picked this blanket, um, number one, it's 100% wool, so it's authentic for the time period. Uh, number two, it's the most beautiful red or scarlet I've ever seen in a wool blanket. Um, and number three was, it, it's an antique, it's old. It might be upwards of 100 years. So on the back, it's got the, the Leeds symbol. So a uh, little bit of history about Leeds, England, or United Kingdom. Um, in, in 1806, they build a canal that connects Liverpool with, um, with Leeds. And now that opens up um, trade, if you would, to two major um, seaports at both ends of, of the United Kingdom with Leeds as its sort of epicenter. And it quickly becomes the, the number one fabric uh, mill business in flax, in wool, and cotton in, in, the United, in the United Kingdom. And if we think, <laughs> this is, I'm gonna get really back in history a bit, but if we think about two things, there's really only two major things that move civilization or civilized man to where we are today. The first being the development of, of agriculture or the pioneering of agriculture, which turns us from hunter-gatherers into agrarian people, giving us time to think, um, invent, etc. So if we fast forward, uh, oh, about 10,000 years, because that development of agriculture is about 10,000 years ago in the Middle East. And we, we, we get to what's known as the, the um, Industrial Revolution. Uh, and credited historians will sort of pinpoint that as 1750 to 1900. And it, essentially there's two phases. So the first phase is 1750 to 1850. And then from 1850 to 1900 is another real explosion because now they've got tools and, and equipment and ideas and inventions and it's just moving at a rapid rate. But if we go back to Leeds and we look at the Industrial Revolution can be attributed to coal, the burning of coal, which powered everything. So in 1660, and this is recorded, uh, Leeds, or sorry, the United Kingdom produced and burnt about two million tons of coal. By 1750, the very year that the Industrial Revolution starts, they're burning 10 million 
um, tons of coal. And by 1900, they're burning 240 million tons of coal. So that, that ch r r literally changes the world as we know it. And Leeds becomes this center of fabric um, on, on the planet, essentially. And in, oh, let's see, 18, uh, no, 1788, a Colonel Lloyd Thompson, Thompson Lloyd, sorry, he, uh, he purchases the Aberlum, Aberly Mill, and he turns it into the largest wool mill on the planet. Uh, and this blanket came from that factory. Anyway, currently that, that structure's still there. It's now a museum, but uh, there, there, there's your wee bit of history. I told you you shouldn't got me started. I suppose you want me to sew now. Can you sew at the same time? I can't do two things at once. Anyway, we'll get back to it. I can't even pick the darn needle up. How's your part coming? I got this gusset on and I pinned it here. That's just for the opening. Right. I can show that. That's gonna come that's looking good. What's gonna be we've got the front sewn to the back and one sleeve on. So you're working on the I've just yep, what I've done here. So I finished this sleeve. I've turned it right side out now. And this shows where we've taken. So we've got our tapered sleeve and we've sewn in this um, square gusset. So if we put them back together, it'd look like so. So we've just sewn it to the two sides. And so that enlarges the area that uh, is in the armpit, if you would. So Kathy's finished the gusset here for the V at the neck, and that would be the inside of it. And you know, we can see this, and that would be the outside. So the only thing left there, a little leather um, tie down and maybe a wee bit of antler, deer antler for a button at the top to hold it closed when the wind's blowing. So we're, we're getting down to it now. Kathy's pinning on the last sleeve. And uh, once that's pinned on, we sew that up, sew up the side, and then we just have the collar to do. We have the shoulder. And this is coming up to the neck, so we've sewn the gusset onto this side, and that will be folded over here. And then we've got all that folded around. So I'm about to sew this gusset onto this side. And then I'll pin it like this and fold it over and then you'll be able to put the collar on. What I'm doing here is trying to fit the collar. In order to do that, I'm going to have to gather some of the excess fabric at the back of the neck and then sew the collar on. So I'm using the shirt that Nancy Miller gave us as a model, and she also wrote the pattern for us. So that's what we're doing. So I'll sew that flat and then stitch on the collar, and that will be the last step. The first collar I made it was too short. I don't know how I cut it too short. So running out of blanket material, I didn't want to make a second mistake. So I left it open-ended at this side. So I've stitched it on the inside. And now I'm just going to trim it. And stitch it up here.
So Kathy and I are uh, almost done our, our new or my new trade shirt and uh, I can't take a lot of credit because Kathy, I've done about 25 or 35 stitches and Kathy's done the rest, but um, it speeds up the process. But we're thinking about it, some people might say, well, that, that's a lot of time. We, it took us about a day, right, to do okay. this? Yeah. So the next one could take us maybe three quarters of a day or, or Kathy three quarters of a day, but. A few less mistakes. There you go. Um, but our ancestors, if they wanted to make such a product, uh, first of all, they had to catch the critter. So they had to catch a sheep, preferably late winter, because that's when the wool is the heaviest and best. Uh, they'd have to shear it. Uh, a good shearer, sheep shearer, could shear the sheep in one piece. The wool, wool come off in one chunk. Uh, from that point, it had to be washed. And in that process, it washed and cleaned. Um, there's some byproducts that, that are actually usable. So a sheep produces a, a waxy material called lanolin, which can be used for medicinal purposes. And modern days, I believe modern times, it could, it's used in cosmetics perhaps. Um, so that was the next process. Then it had to be carded. So you had two paddles with fine little, at least originally that's how it was done, and you'd pull, pull the fiber apart into longer strips. So wool is very curly and it's very stiff. So this both softens and straightens the wool. Then it had to be spun and it's two to five strands are spun on a spinning wheel uh, into what we would recognize as yarn today. And then it was off to the loom. Uh, well, before that it had to be dyed and I took off my legging strap that our good friend Dennis Caron from Quebec uh, was down. He was on our on one of our episodes and a walking encyclopedia about sashes. Uh, and he uses natural dyes. So w wool will take dye very easily because it absorbs water very easily. So they use natural dyes. So what Dennis used for this beautiful green that I have here, he uh, used indigo for the blue. Uh, he used a goldenrod for the yellow. So you mix blue and yellow together, you get this gorgeous green. Uh, Anyway, that's uh, not, not quite so easy. It makes it a lot harder if we were actually living in 1700s than trying to live at being in the 1700s. We have life a lot easier in today's world. And if you think about it, I, I can go on here. Now I got me started on fiber. Um, the linen shirt that I'm wearing underneath here, uh, instead of catching a critter, you gotta till up some soil and plant some seed. So you plant the flax seed. Uh, it has to grow for approximately 100 days. Um, you can't cut it like you'd cut wheat or straw because <clears throat> the sap would, uh, would run out of the plant too quickly and that would spoil the fiber. So it all has to be pulled out by the root, dried. Then it goes into a process um, called rippling where big combs are used to take off the leaves and the seed and what have you. And then it goes into a retting process. <laughs> if you research this, uh, you come up with a whole new vocabulary of words. In the writing process, they use moisture to break down the woody fiber on the outside of the plant uh, to get access to the fiber they want to make the cloth or the material. Uh, and the writing process, it, it absolutely stinks, <laughs> that, that process. Uh, then it gets carted out, similar to carding of wool. And uh, then it's off to the dye bath, and then it's off to the loom, and then it's on to bobbins, and then, yeah, it's just, uh, life's pretty darn easy now. How are we doing? Almost done? Perfect. Ready to try on? Yeah, let's do it.